So far, we've discussed just the simple case of a one-dimensional crystal. This already shows us much of the basic behavior of crystals, and this one-dimensional model is quite simple to understand. Of course, real crystals have more dimensions. Mostly, they are three-dimensional, such as the crystalline materials like salt or diamond. A few interesting ones are two-dimensional, such as the graphene sheets that, when stacked one on top of another, form graphite, the main constituent of pencil leads. And I've got a crystal model here of graphite. You can see it's made of alternating layers, each of which has got a sort of hexagonal lattice shape to it. And this set of layers here constitutes graphite. As I say, that's what's in pencil leads. And if I were to take off just one layer, one sheet out of this, I would have a sheet of what's called graphene. And that is also of some considerable interest these days. In these higher dimensions, necessarily the structures, like our graphite, are more complicated, both in the real space of the crystals and in the K space in which we discuss block states. The K vectors of the block states are now in two or three dimensions also, corresponding to the wave directions in these spaces. The band structures have to reflect these higher dimensions also. The Brillouin zones must have the same number of dimensions as the crystal. Of course, this higher dimensionality makes a band structure difficult to draw completely because we would need a four-dimensional diagram, three coordinate directions and another coordinate to show the energies. Despite that, in simplified diagrams, we can still show band structures. And we will show here how that is typically done. Here we'll look at just one example of a three-dimensional Brillouin zone. Specifically, we'll look at the one that corresponds to the diamond or zinc blend lattice, which we remember corresponded to the so-called face-centered cubic arrangement of pairs of atoms. So, this Brillouin zone for the diamond or zinc blend lattice is itself a three-dimensional object. And here's a sketch of what this Brillouin zone, as conventionally drawn, actually looks like. This shape might seem strange at first, but we'll see how it is put together to form the overall structure that we call reciprocal space with all of these Brillouin zones. So this exists, as I said, in K space or reciprocal space, not in real space. And here are three conventional directions. These are the cube edge directions, the same directions as we have in real space, but these are now in K space. And two particularly important directions in this case are the so-called X direction. So this would be an X direction here. And also in the way that we talk about these, we would typically also refer to these other two directions as being equivalent to the X direction. And the L point, or L direction, this would be an example of an L direction, which is along the space diagonal direction of the real space cube. And this is one L point on one of these hexagonal faces, in this case, of this Brillouin zone. And the center of the Brillouin zone is what's called the gamma point. So, at least as a first useful representation of band structure, what we typically do is calculate the band structure along the particularly interesting directions. So, this would be one of them, and that would be equivalent to this direction or this direction. And this space diagonal direction, the direction out to the L point here, or the L direction, is another interesting direction. So, we calculate the band structure along this line, for example, and then to the X point and also out to the L point here. We could calculate the band structure along any other lines as well, but those are the two ones typically used, first of all, for a structure such as this zinc blend Brillouin zone. So here, for example, is a calculated band structure for silicon. And you see various different bands here. These are the ones that are most interesting in the structure of silicon. And silicon, as we said earlier on, is an indirect gap material. 
So the minimum in the conduction band is out here along this so-called x direction from the gamma point, although it's not actually right at the edge. The lowest point is somewhat in from the edge, and this is sometimes called the delta point in silicon. So this is a sketch of these major valence and conduction bands in silicon. As I said, the conduction band has its minimum at this delta point, as it's called. And by Cramer's degeneracy, of course, when we're plotting a band structure such as this, we need only show one half of the band structure, for example, along the x direction. There's really no need to show the other half of the band structure heading out in the negative x direction, because it's essentially the same. So what we do on these drawings is we use the other half of the figure, conventionally, to represent the band structure along some other direction, and typically the one chosen would be the L direction. So this is the band structure going from the centre of the Brillouin zone out to the X point, and this is the band structure going from the centre of the Brillouin zone out to the L point. So we're using the other half of the figure for the band structure in another direction. Similarly, this is the gallium arsenide band structure, or a sketch of the gallium arsenide band structure for the most important valence and conduction bands. It's got many similarities to that of the silicon band structure, which is in part because they're both based on the same kind of diamond lattice. But it so happens that in the gallium arsenide band structure, the minimum in the conduction band is also at the gamma point, where the maxima in the valence bands here are. And that means that gallium arsenide, unlike silicon, is a direct gap semiconductor. Now, the full Brillouin zone here we have shown is, of course, just one of the Brillouin zones. We can keep on going into extended zone schemes. And in three dimensions, the additional Brillouin zones, of course, still just repeat the same band structure. So here's what we might think of as the first Brillouin zone, this interesting shape here. And these Brillouin zones, in a crystallographic sense, form unit cells in K space or reciprocal space. That is, the Brillouin zones can be stacked one on top of the other to completely fill K space, just like a crystal lattice structure in real space consists of a set of bricks or unit cells that can be stacked side by side and on top of one another to fill all space. The Brillouin zones are similarly unit cells but in a reciprocal space. So we can start stacking these together. This would be one of the extended Brillouin zones. We can build up a nice little lattice of these if we like. Stacking them one on top of the other like this and so on. And you can see that these rather strange looking shapes actually do fit together to fill all of this reciprocal space. Just add a few more here. Put one on the top. So these Brillouin zones are unit cells in reciprocal space or K-space. If we were to take each of these unit cells in reciprocal space and mark the same point on each one of them, so it might be the gamma point in the center, it doesn't matter which point we choose here as long as we're consistent, and we start stacking them up with all of these points in the middle, And then we erase from our drawing here all of the actual unit cells, the Brillouin zone shapes, just to leave the points. And then we add some guidelines. We see that these Brillouin zones are unit cells of what is called a body-centered cubic lattice. So that's a particular quirk of the face-centered cubic lattice. The Brillouin zones corresponding to face-centered cubic lattices actually form a body-centered cubic lattice. There are lattice points on the corners of this cube here and one down in the middle. And in general, for different ones of the lattice shapes in real space, there are other shapes for the lattices in the reciprocal space. So this particular reciprocal lattice with one mathematical lattice point for each Brillouin zone is typically the one meant 
when we talk about the reciprocal lattice. It's a lattice form that is a sort of dual of the real space lattice form. And the vectors in K space between these lattice points are called reciprocal lattice vectors. So these various vectors here are reciprocal lattice vectors between the different points in this reciprocal space. <laughs> Thank you.